welcome to Elkton United Methodist Church for our online worship service. It is a great morning to be together to worship and especially great because I'm welcoming back my sidekick, Mike Schmook. And I'm delighted to be here with you, Pastor Karen. We're welcoming Roger back to the sound booth, Suzette Burgess, our song stylist, Brian Wilmore on the keyboards, and I want to take a moment to thank all those of you who sent flowers. No, you didn't send me flowers, but you sent me <laughs> cards, and you sent me prayers, and you sent me messages, and I appreciate them all. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. I have a couple of big announcements at the end of the service today. Thank you, Mike. But no flowers. <laughs> Let's turn our hearts to God in prayer and prepare ourselves for worship by giving God thanks for all the blessings that he's poured into our lives and ask him to bless us in this time of worship. Let us pray. Would you join me, please, for our call to worship? We have been created to be God's children, but we are free to accept or deny this identity. We have come to tell the world that we want to live as sons and daughters of God. In Christ, we are called to participate in the life of God. We may come or stay away. We have come to tell the world that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Praise be to God.
God is faithful to those who turn to him and turn away from our sins. May the whispers of our heart be pleasing to God as we share the prayer of confession. Gracious God, we hear you calling. You have shown us hope and you offer us courage. We come to you as people who long to walk your pathways of grace and love. But many times, God, we get discouraged by our living. We are afraid of the difficult experiences. We despair at challenges that are given to us. The roads we walk find us weary sometimes, and we let hopelessness get the best of us. Care for us on our journey, Lord. Help us to know that your love is always there, sustaining us and surrounding us with care. Take our road-weary lives and transform us to be your new people, shining in the darkness. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves us. God blesses us with new beginnings and new life. Never forget the gift of God's redeeming grace. We are forgiven. See you. 
Our lesson from the Hebrew scriptures today comes from Exodus. Exodus 3, starting at verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and lo, the bush was burning, yet was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Then he said, Do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians, and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me, they will ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, May th say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Dark midnight was my cry, dark 
midnight was my cry. Dark midnight was my cry. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You Our gospel reading today comes from Luke 18, starting at verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your mother and father. And he said, All these I have observed from my youth. And when Jesus heard it, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have in treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus, looking at him, said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. doing a lot of pondering lately. I suspect that anyone approaching retirement does a lot of pondering. I thought a lot about the 35 years I've been in pastoral ministry, the places, the people, the experiences, the ups and downs. Looking back, it's gone by in a flash, in the blink of an eye. There have been so many high holy moments along the way, but today I'm thinking of one moment in particular, a moment that changed my life. It happened in a place called Drayton Manor, a beautiful, beautiful retreat center that used to be owned by our annual conference. It was an old colonial manor house with beautiful sloping green lawns that stretched all the way down to the water's edge. And it was there sitting on one of those lawns at the top of the hill that the moment happened. I was on a retreat with the administrative council of my home church, which was Asbury United Methodist Church in Newcastle, Delaware. And at that time, I was employed full-time as a secretary at the University of Delaware. But in my spare time, I helped lead the youth group at Asbury. I led the handbell choir. I served on the Commission on Education and the Administrative Council. And I helped to lead worship and so on. And so we're at this retreat at Drayton Manor, and we're taking a break. And the senior pastor, Ron Bergman, and I went for a walk. 
and we eventually stopped and sat down on that grassy hill to gaze over the beautiful water. And that's when it happened. Ron turned to me and out of the blue, at least for me, he asked, Karen, do you think that God might be calling you to ordain ministry? That moment I had no idea that his question would change my life. I am certain that the same could be said for a man named Moses. One day, one ordinary day, he was just going about his business when something happened that changed his life. He saw a burning bush, a bush that was burning but oddly was not being consumed by the fire. It caught his attention, but good. And then he heard a voice, God's voice. God told him that he needed him for God's people were in trouble and needed someone to lead them out of Egypt and God had chosen him. Well, clearly Moses felt unworthy because his first reply was just that, who am I that I should go? And God tried to reassure him, don't worry, I'll be with you. But it wasn't enough because Moses came back at God. But what if the people question me? What if they ask who sent me? Again, God patiently answered Moses' questions. A third time, Moses comes back at God. But Lord, suppose the people don't believe me. Suppose they don't think that you really appeared to me. This time, God did a little show and tell, if you will, changing Moses' staff into a snake and then changing it back again. I guess Moses was still a little skeptical because God went to plan B. And he told Moses to put his hand in his cloak, and when he drew it out, it was filled with leprosy. But then when he put it back in, God cured him, and his hand came out the second time, white as snow. You would think that would have convinced Moses. But no, he tried a fourth time to talk God out of it. But Lord, I'm not good at public speaking. Surely someone else could do this better. Again, God reassured Moses he would be with him, but still Moses dragged his feet. Lord, Lord, please send somebody else. The scripture says that God's anger was kindled at that point, and he reminded Moses that his brother Aaron was a good speaker, and he could do the speaking for him. And then finally, finally Moses came around, and he answered the call, and you know the rest of the story. He led God's people out of Egypt, and he is counted as a great hero in the story of our faith family. You know, I suspect that more often than not, when God calls someone to a new vocation, God hears all sorts of excuses. That certainly was the case with me. It's not that I was inclined immediately to say no, it's that I, like Moses, didn't feel worthy. There were so many strikes against me that I was sure that God had it wrong. First of all, I was uncomfortable speaking in front of people. You know, when I went to college at Salisbury, I was planning initially to be a history teacher. But the longer I went, the more petrified I became of standing up in front of a class speaking, and so I changed my major to just history. How could God be calling me? How could God be calling someone to be a pastor who was afraid to speak in front of people? And there were other things as well. I, I didn't like going to funerals. At that point in my life, which was my late 20s, I had only been to a handful of funerals. And now God was asking me to take on a vocation, which included not only going to funerals, but officiating them. I wasn't particularly fond of hospitals either, who is? But answering the call meant being in hospitals with people and sometimes being with them when they were dying. I didn't know if I could do it. The list went on and on, but the bottom line is that I didn't feel worthy. But God was patient with me as God was patient with Moses. And as he told Moses, so he told me, I will be with you all the way. And so he has been. Now, you know what? You may feel like this story, this story of being called by God has nothing to do with you. I respectfully disagree. Because while not everyone receives a vocational call to ministry, I believe God calls everyone to do something which is why I chose the gospel lesson, the second lesson I did for this service. This call in that lesson in the life of the young ruler actually comes in a different way. It comes from that man himself. He comes to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to him. 
He comes to Jesus because he knows that something is missing in his life, but he's not quite sure what it is. He's been the perfect person of faith. He's memorized scripture, he's memorized the laws, he follows the rules, he's done everything right, yet something is missing. And Jesus knows it too. And when he tells him what it is, that he is burdened by his possessions, and that if he lets that go, he will find what he's looking for, it's too much. And sadly, the rich young ruler walks away. If he could have just trusted Jesus, he would have experienced abundant life instead of the sadness wrought by always having to be in control. You know, one pastor put it well when she wrote this. For all the truth that I am not capable of being and doing what it would take to make my own way into heaven, the promise is that it's already been done. And so maybe, just maybe, the gift and promise of the story of the rich young ruler is that you and I get a taste of the eternal life that Jesus offers us even now, even in small ways, as we make choices which mean giving away part of ourselves for the sake of something more as we seek to follow him. Even if you're not being called to a vocation, all of us as children of God and followers of Christ are called to give away part of ourselves for the sake of others, for the sake of something more. The question is how we do that. And the problem is, frankly, that too often we're afraid to do something, to try something new, to reach out and take risks, to go out of our comfort zone. You know, we read these stories of spiritual superheroes like Moses and know that we're nothing like him. The good news is we don't have to be. And the even better news is that when God called him, he wasn't a spiritual superhero either. Neither were the disciples. All of them were ordinary people doing ordinary things, just like you and me, until God called them to something more, and they said yes. You know, I know all this talk of answering a call from God makes people nervous. You're not really sure what it means. You're not sure you're up to doing something new. If you're honest, you might be kind of comfortable doing what you're doing and being who you are right now. The truth is, we make answering God's call in our lives more stressful than it needs to be. Listen, you can answer God's call to action in big and small ways. You don't have to change the world. You don't have to give up your career and go into the ministry. You just need to listen to the nudging of the Holy Spirit when he calls. And so let me show you what I mean by means of a video clip that someone forwarded to me this week. Shoulder taps. So Tony and I are having lunch at California Pizza Kitchen the other day and across from us I no noticed this elderly woman sit down. She's dressed nicely and she's at a large table by herself for about five minutes and then what appears to be her daughter shows up and I don't recall two or three grandkids and they all look spectacular, uh, ready for a nice meal obviously. And at about that time, a voice in my head starts saying, you need to go tell her how pretty she looks. So I don't even know if we're eating at this point or not, but the food arrives, check arrives. We're going to go down the walkway a little bit in this strip center and look for something. And um, that's the next thing that we're going to move to. So, so Tony stands up. I don't tell her any of this. Um, and on my way out, I just kneel down and kind of get into this position where I'm at her level, right, where she's now in her in her chair. And I said, uh, hey, if nobody else has told you yet today, um, I just want you to hear from me how lovely you are. And she looks at me with a look I've never seen before and says, I know you. And I said, no, you, we, we don't know each other. And she said, I know your spirit. And it gets really quiet between us. And she says, my husband died a year ago. And that's something he would have said to me. And at that moment, I can't talk. I can't talk. I'm overcome by emotion. And I just hug her and smile at her through tears. And I leave. 
But here's what I know, and here's the reason I'm telling you this. I believe that God taps us on the shoulders and uses us at just the right moment. And what I know for sure is that she was blessed and I was enormously blessed. So I've learned in my life to listen to these shoulder taps because they do happen. And I believe the more that we listen to them, the more in alignment we are with God. And that's an awesome place to be. Shoulder taps. You see, that man showed so perfectly how God works, sometimes in shoulder taps. Sometimes he taps you on the shoulder and tells you to do something, maybe big, maybe small. But look what happened when that man said yes to God's bidding. He touched that woman in such a special way, and bonus, he was touched as well. Dear friends, our God is a calling God. He calls us because he has gifted us in unique ways and wants us to use those gifts. He calls us because others need to know him and we're the ones that will show him to them. And he calls us because he knows that in answering his call, our lives will be richer, fuller, and closer to him. And so my friends, whether one day you see a burning bush or hear an invitation from a friend sitting with you on a grassy hill, or feel a light tap on your shoulder calling you to speak to someone, I pray that you'll not immediately think that I can't do this, but rather you will trust that the God who is calling you will give you what you need to do what he asks and will be with you through it all. May it be so. Amen. In our morning prayer, I offer three names for you to keep in your hearts. First of all, Helen Taylor is Diane Thompson's mother. Jenny Selner has been hospitalized in Florida, and we extend our sympathy to Joan Perry on the death of her sister. With that, would you pray with me, please? Redeeming God. Out of the flames of your creation, your voice calls, marking us as your own. Yet there are times when we choose to ignore your voice and listen instead to our own needs 
and desires. But in spite of our resistance, you offer again your invitation to know your love, to be loved, and to respond to your call. In hearing your voice, may we find our place within your creation. And dear Father, Jesus' words have a way of piercing our hearts and defensives that we have built up against you and doing things your way. Make us tender-hearted. Gently expose the reservations of our hearts as you did for that wealthy young man those many centuries ago. But give us grace to be able to obey you, you who alone can heal our corrupt and deceitful hearts and make us whole. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for clinging to the remnants of a life independent of you and make us wholly yours. Heavenly Father, you called a reluctant Moses. What a long period of training Moses had to undergo to be prepared for the work you destined to do in his life. At times, we are so impetuous and want things done in our lives immediately, and yet we realize that you take time to call and train and fashion and hone your servants into the things you have prepared for them to do. Develop that same patient spirit and humble heart we see in Moses and remove from our character anything that dishonors your holy name. May your hand be upon us, let your love fill us, and let your joy overwhelm us as we now raise our voices together with the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. turn now to our time of announcements and I want you to know that we're still working on plans for when we can come back in person for worship uh, trying to get systems into place we're not sure exactly when that's going to happen but we know it won't be next week so come right back here next week for another online worship service again I thank you as always for faithfully giving your offerings and remind you that you can give them via our church website elktonumc.org by clicking on the PayPal link or by sending them into the church office Speaking of the church office right now, just so you know, the church office is open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings from 9 to noon. And also speaking of the church office, you should have received or will receive soon uh, some information from Beth, our church secretary, trying to update our church records. We've realized during this time of pandemic, when we're trying to get a hold of people, we have wrong phone numbers, wrong email addresses, so we're trying to get the database uh, perfect. So she sent out the forms. If you could. Um, fill in the information, correct them, and send them back. We would appreciate it. Now let us join together in our closing hymn. <laughs>
friends, be at peace and know that the peace of God is with you. Amen. and I, like you, have been waiting this whole service to find out what Mike has to say to us. And Mike, it's yours. Well, thank you. I want you to all mark your calendars right now for June 28th. June 28th will be the last broadcast of Pastor Karen's with us. But that afternoon, starting at 1 o'clock until the cars stop rolling, we're going to have a drive-by, farewell, retirement, party-like thing happening here. Stay in your car. Uh, let me tell you, there'll be certain style points given for decorations and signage, and uh, maybe even special bonuses for any car that comes with music somehow part of their presentation. Well, let's send her out the door the right way. June 28th, 1 p.m. I understand that was, I, that's not a surprise, right? I understand it's not a they surprise. said it was okay. What are we gonna do at five after when it's okay. over? <laughs> well, I'll go around the block a couple more times. Very also, good. I told you I would share something with you about my surgery. Yes, it was a pacemaker that keeps me going, and they gave me this really cool apparatus to help me monitor my progress. It goes right into my cell phone, which is handy, no additional equipment to buy, and I thought I'd just give you a little sample here of what they've done for me here. stop monitoring. You see, the drums, they were standard, but I opted to upgrade to include the cymbals also. You're it's good to be back with you, Karen. You are a piece of work. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. We hope you've enjoyed the service. Have a great week. We'll see you same place next Sunday morning. Take care. told you when he had the surgery he'd be re-energized <laughs> well we're we're wonderful we're bleh, bleh, bleh. darn you don't get it twice honey you don't get it twice now we got to start over I'm sorry <laughs> it won't come out the same whatever I said <laughs> uh, I'm sorry Roger start over